The world is fractured as stock markets climb to new record highs fueled by tech companies and their growing dominance in the global economy. Wealth inequality is widening. In this episode of the Davos Guide, we're going to look at fractured society and analyse how governments and businesses can address social inequality, shaping policy to close the gaps in income and gender. Income inequality has increased in nearly every region of the world in recent decades. According to the 2018 World Inequality Report, the top 0.1% have captured as much income growth since 1980 as the entire bottom half of the world's population. This growing disparity is seen as a key driver in the rise of populism. Business leaders at last year's World Economic Forum weighed in on the ways globalisation has benefited and failed society. The promise of trickle-down has not worked. The promises given by Davos man, trust us, leave it to us and we will bring prosperity for all, simply hasn't worked. And the Davos gap has grown. We've seen market failure in many respects, from the environment to financial markets, and now we see the failure of markets and, the je and how it's jeopardizing our democracies. We start with collaboration embedded in our products, but we also think about the importance of collaboration because we do have a shared responsibility to ensure that everyone benefits from, the, uh, from technology. It isn't just business CEOs, it's you, the media, it's NGOs, it's government as well, and politicians. None of us are trusted. So virtually everyone here at Davos is not trusted. So we have a job to do because clearly we haven't communicated those things that are important about the benefits of globalization, of the benefits of technology, and we have to address the issue that there are people who feel and have been left behind. We have seen across the world uh, the benefits of globalization. Uh, I mean, some of us are the direct beneficiaries. Uh, of that, um, but we've also seen the, the tensions, um, the cracks in the system, uh, which then found a political translation, uh, because if people feel that the system is not working for them, uh, that will find a kind of political expression. Technology is at the heart of the debate around inequality, both as a contributor and as a cure. Whilst critics uh, fear the rise of robots will threaten jobs and eliminate industries, proponents argue that technological advancements will create more opportunities than they destroy. Now, we spoke to industry executives about how technology is transforming their businesses. There is a shortage of technical, high-skilled workers in the United States and all over the world. The world is being disrupted very aggressively, very sharply, by the technology sector. And in that sector, the real differentiator is people. We can add much more value to our customers by providing interesting services. Uptime speed and yield is still very, very important in industry. Digital allows us to get to the next level of productivity improvement. That will create wealth, that will create competitiveness, and that also will create jobs. Fortunately, our customers are demanding more and more data. Uh, that being in the western part of the world, but also in Asia, in emerging markets. So we are trying our best to actually uh, invest in an effort to deliver the, the data demand. We also asked how the World Economic Forum's 2016 message on the fourth industrial revolution was progressing in real markets. It's renewable of which the price has been divided by five in the past six years. It's about storage divided, the cost divided by three in the past five years. And, and more so, it's about digitization. So the fourth industrial revolution that we are all talking about in terms of technology applied to energy and consumption, making that you are connected to the energy you are consuming, you know what you are doing with your energy, and you adapt to the conditions out there. We have been beneficiaries uh, as an industry of, uh, of doing things cheaper than others at the same quality. And I think that that's no longer enough, that with automation, uh, with the need for innovation that businesses around the world have, we really need to step it up and accelerate the, the rate at which we can bring new ideas to life for our customers and bring automation to improve the efficiency of the work that we do. I think that, uh, I mean, Yulmert builds kind of a new generation model of the uh, internet retailing and uh, nevertheless you know brick and mortar 
I think will still dominate. Uh, joining us now, Manish uh, Shafiq, LSE Director, and Sharon Burrow, uh, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, Sharon, let me, let me start here with you. I mean, as you heard from those clips, there was plenty of talk about uh, wealth inequality. Um, do you think that there was very much done through 2017 to tackle it? No. In fact, uh, it's getting worse. Our world's fractured on every indicator. If you look at conflict, it's growing. Military spends higher than ever. We've got an historic level of displacement of people. And we're on the precipice, potentially, through uh, the craziness of rising authoritarianism in democratic countries, consolidated dictatorship of even a nuclear precipice. Jobs uh, are not coming back at the rate we need. Wages are way down. In fact, we've got a two-tier world where corporate greed's created the 1%. So there's the wealthy and there's the working people and their families. And on any indicator, progress for women has stagnated. When you look at that and then look at the, the la labour market uh, disruptions in a convergence we've never seen before, climate change, technology, demographics, a, a whole mess of challenges then working people are simply losing hope in every institution and that sees the rise of some of that uh, uh, frightening authoritarianism or worse, consolidated uh, dictatorship and alliances of dictators. That's a very bleak picture that you paint. Is there no silver lining in any of these dark clouds? Is there no evidence that governments are becoming more aware of the need to tackle this and are being proactive? Well, I think people talk about it. I think the acknowledgement's clearly there. You've got inequality uh, accepted as a global risk from the IMF, the OECD, the ILO, right across the spectrum, in, uh, and governments uh, as well. But what you don't have is the simple recipe that would actually do something about it. As we face the uh, fourth industrial revolution, indeed, we're already seeing the impact, as we see the impact of... Uh, climate change on uh, people's lives and livelihoods, then we know that people will tell you it's not the technology they fear, although there'll be some societal debates about uh, human-centred deployment, contract and mediation, it's actually deep anxiety about their jobs. And so when you know that if you want to make an economy robust, if you want to talk to working people seriously, you have to talk about sharing our wealth with social protection, a minimum living wage on which people can live. 84% of the world's people say the minimum wage is not at a level you can anymore live on with dignity. And we have to look at collective bargaining to share productivity. In 30 years, productivity has continually gone up, but labour income shares slumped. That's a risk to the global economy. But what of robotry and uh, AI and uh, changes in production, digitalisation? Productivity will grow but how will it be shared? And my final point on this is we want to look at what makes us human. We are three times richer as a globe. Not only is that not being distributed in income to working families, but when you look at countries like Britain who can't even pay, one of the wealthiest countries in the world won't even pay for its health service, what good is the health technology if uh, working people can't access it? This is, this is a two-tier world and the fracturing is right across the board. Um, Manoush, I know a lot of what Sharon just said echoes uh, what you've been thinking, the work you've been doing. I've been looking at some of your notes as well and concerns mm. about a whole host of issues. Let's add in demographics. Let's add in them and us to us as well. Mm. Do you have any more hope than Sharon does or do you feel that we've just got so many miles to go before we get public thinking mm. on, on, the, on the right track? Well, I think there's, there's action needed on two fronts. Uh, one is the issue of the role of tax systems and what they've done to inequality. Um, you know, globalization and technology have exacerbated inequality, but our tax systems have made it worse by reducing top rates of tax, by raising VAT, which hits poorer people more than rich people. So we do need to re-engage and have a new debate about progressivity of our tax system. I think the second key area, which there hasn't been enough thinking about, is rethinking our welfare states. The welfare state is there to protect people when they're hit by shocks and help them to adjust to the new economy. And 
I think there's a lot of thinking about that that needs to be done to make our welfare states fit for the 21st century, to help workers adjust to the world of automation, to deal with the fact that we're living longer and we'll have to work much longer, and to help people adjust to, to new jobs and prepare for new jobs that we don't even begin to fathom. And, and this has manifested itself in, in populism in the polls as well. People are very unhappy with many, many aspects of society. Yeah. But are the right kind of populist leaders being looked at? We've seen some far left candidates, some very far right candidates, which still have a lot of popularity uh, in elections in Europe, elections in the United States as well. So, so the question remains, is, it, this is manifesting itself in populism in the polls. Is it creating leaders who are going to make any difference whatsoever? Well, I think we're at that horrible moment when the populists on the left and the right are exacerbating the divisions in society. And I think you know, one of the things we're trying to do at the London School of Economics is, is create a rational debate in the middle around solutions. Uh, and I think that's where we need to move the public debate. And there are solutions. You know, if you think about uh, if enabling workers to adjust to a world of automation, if most routine and repetitive work will be automated in some way, and I should say that, you know, the last revolution affected workers in manufacturing. This is going to affect accountants and lawyers and teachers and, med and doctors. So this new automation will be much more widespread and will affect many more jobs. We should be looking at making part-time work more normal and making part-time work secure in terms of the benefits you get if you work part-time. We should be looking at extending working lives and we should be investing much more in active labour market policies to help workers adjust to these So that investment jobs. in people, that investment in different working models. Sharon, I've known you for many years and I've had the pleasure of speaking to you at quite a few Davoses as well. And, 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 and there you are, you're back as a co-chair in 2018, which, which is a fantastic thing. But Davos man, it's still Davos man. <laughs> Davos man hasn't been listening because their <laughs> deed hasn't matched the word as well. So, so how are you going to bang heads together in 2018 and make a difference, Sharon? Well, if you ask me whether this uh, rise of the alpha leader has created a wave of misogyny, you know my answer is yes. So uh, Davos man needs to listen if he cares about his families and particularly the question of equality and, uh, and equal opportunity for his daughters. But look, I think Manoush is right. If there is enough of us who focus on solutions, if there's enough of us who say we can redefine what will actually bring down inequality, for us, I've already said it's a very simple recipe. Share the prosperity through wages, through social protection. I would say, Minutia, let's stop talking about the welfare society. Let's start saying why do working people, who are now the only people basically paying tax in the US and many other countries, my own in Australia included, what do they pay taxes for? They actually pay taxes for shared health systems. They pay taxes for shared education systems. They pay taxes for care, health care, aged care. These are the things that bring cohesive societies, reduce the risk of division and conflict. And then, of course, they also create basic economies. So when you actually create jobs in care, the jobs dividend by investing in care is triple that of anything else. And the next equivalent is infrastructure. So if we have to deal with jobs, then investing in infrastructure and care are our two best bets. Let's end the speculative economy where the 1% is making money. I wish they were losing it, but making money. And that uh, conversation I was listening to about uh, Amazon in a previous Davos guide, being allowed not to make money while it consolidates beyond any sense of global uh, scale that most people understand, this is ridiculous. If we're not prepared and governments aren't prepared because they're captured by corporate interests to put in place the regulatory environment that will allow the solutions that are simple, and let's do it with people and considered CEOs. I work with the B team. They're not perfect. They'll tell you they're not perfect as companies, but they care about responsibilities. They know that we need a different world and that conversation as robust as it can be between, you know, all of us is what we have to do. So let's start building a convergence on consensus and let's stop pretending that if we just sell this kind of rotten world based on corporate greed better, it'll be okay. <laughs>
Strong words, and I'm looking forward to hearing more of it in uh, Davos in 2018, Sharon. But also, we'll speak to you both, of course, after a very short break. And uh, coming up after that break, uh, a scandal that sparked a global campaign against sexual misconduct. How will the Me Too movement evolve in 2018? And how much will gender equality and inequality dominate the agenda in Davos? In October 2017, a sexual abuse scandal around Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein triggered one of the biggest campaigns for social change in recent history. What started with Weinstein quickly spread beyond the entertainment industry, engulfing journalists and politicians and sparking a larger conversation about sexual misconduct and gender equality. The Me Too hashtag spread on social media, inspiring millions to share their stories and make a stand against harassment. At the end of 2017, Time magazine named the Silence Breakers as their its person of the year. Well, earlier this year, CNBC spoke with American A-list legend Jane Fonda about the impact of the revelations. I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm glad it's coming out. Thank God it's coming out. Thank, thank God women are talking because back in the days, we were too scared to talk. We also had a chance to speak to actress Gwyneth Paltrow. She talked to CNBC for the first time about her role as one of the early victims to speak out about her experience in Hollywood and how it has now influenced the industry. I think it's incredible what's happening. I think this, this is long overdue. There's this, been this incredible confluence of events um, that's really led to women coming together and feeling safe in numbers to come forward and talk about um, their experiences across all different industries. And, you know, it's my hope that this is the beginning of something important and different and that my daughter, when she goes into the workplace, won't experience what you and presumably you and I and millions of other women have had to um, endure. And so, you know, it, it, it feels it feels important, and um, I'm happy that I have played a small part in it. Young actresses, what advice would you give them? Because they're coming to Hollywood, but it, obviously, as we've seen, it be very brutal. What advice would you give them to navigate it? It's a really good question. I mean, I think that um, it's difficult because I think a lot of I, I think a lot of people are drawn to this industry because they are looking to find wholeness through fame or and I would say like if that's why you're here then don't like the only reason to do this is if you have an incredible burning desire to channel creativity and to to really be an artist first and foremost I mean I think that the the culture that we're living in now is rewarding cheap fame and I think that a lot of people think that the industry is a way to do that you know, I'm very heartened by what I see in my daughter's generation. These girls are kick ass. Like, they are strong. They know themselves. They're very protective of their physical space. They're not like I was at 13, you know? Um, they're very sure footed. They're thinking big. I think something really interesting is coming in the next generation. I think these girls are amazing. Still with us, uh, Manu Shafiq, LSE Director and former Deputy Governor uh, for Markets and Banking at the Bank of England, and Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, Sharon, let me ask you, where do you think this phenomena, this movement, this, this long overdue exercise in exposing the misogynists in our society, where does this go in 2018? Well, I mean, I'm not surprised either. And I think what the, the really healthy element of this debate is the exposure of the fear that women have been condemned by. Makes me feel actually quite old when I think that 30 years ago we were debating the rules around uh, sexual harassment, sexual violence. And I was actually uh, in a role where I was teaching women how to deal with uh, sexual harassment. But when you look today and you see again the wave of, uh, you know, the legitimacy provoked by people like Donald Trump around misogyny, around harassment, then that's a shocking indictment of our society. But what's worse 
And I'm proud to say, again, with the B team, we've made sexual violence uh, against women, or not just sexual violence, violence against women generally a priority for next year to work on in our workplaces. And there'll be a major debate for a global standard around this at the ILO in June to cover our workplaces. But, you know, the statistics are pretty awful when women are uh, not just being harassed, but in fact being killed by their partners in numbers that are extraordinary. But let me say, while this is horrific and it, and it must be exposed and we must deal with it, it also links back to societal breakdown. If, in fact, we aren't convinced about what are the values that underpin our societies, if we're not sharing our wealth so that violence erupts on any front, then we are not dealing with a holistic approach to this. So, yes, let's end the, uh, the culture of violence and harassment, but let's also make sure that we're putting in sustainable foundations where people can, in fact, find some equal opportunity and equal uh, status on which to negotiate their lives with each other because they're not struggling just to survive. But, but, but Sharon Manoush, I can't help thinking, and look, I'm a man, so I, I have to look at it in that prism. That's all I can do. But <laughs> Jeff and I do That's have... That's the word. <laughs> we do have many daughters between us, so we have that same fear going forward. Mm. I, I, and Manoush, I think as appalling and as abhorrent as the misogyny and sexual violence is towards women, and towards anyone for that matter, mm. that is one thing. But I think the thing that I'm more scared about for our young daughters is the lack of opportunity. Now, you, you have a doctorate. You are... Uh, a woman who's gone through the economics profession and done stunningly well but but when my daughters are discriminated against in things like stem going forward because girls don't do stem which is just an appalling attitude mm. that i think is more pervasive perhaps than, than i'm hoping isolated disgusting cases of sexual uh, harassment violence and misogyny it's the broader issues about how society treats girls that i have an issue with yeah well i mean Clearly, they're related. Sexual harassment is about power, not about sex. And it's about unfair power relationships. And the more women we have at senior levels, the less that is going to be a problem. So I, I quite agree with you that that's definitely part of the solution. Um, you know, it's not all grim. You know, when I look at the younger generation of women, many of whom we teach at the London School of Economics, we now have more young women than we have men in our graduating classes. Uh, this next generation of women have very different expectations about the workplace. Uh, so the direction of travel is good, uh, but there is still a huge gap to be filled. In particular, you know, the recent furor, for example, about wage gaps in the workplace and, and the huge gender gaps which exist throughout, throughout uh, the world. Uh, we need to address that. Some of it, admittedly, is about getting more women at senior levels, but there are still many places where women are paid differently for equal work at the same level. Uh, and every decent organization should look at itself, as we've done at the London School of Economics, looked at all of our faculty, looked at their degrees, their performance, their track records, and made sure that everyone's being paid equally for equal work. That is a minimum that everyone should be able to do immediately. And then the longer term issues about getting more women at the senior level is obviously a longer term solution. And is, is the right approach here, Sharon, to regulate companies to disclose pay differentials uh, above a certain size or should all companies be forced to do this? Well, there's no doubt that across all of these issues, if companies accepted their responsibilities laid out in the UN Business and uh, Human Rights Guidelines for due diligence, then we would be at least down the path of finding the solutions. You know, when you have up to 94% of the global supply chain's workforce, a hidden workforce because CEOs who know they depend on these workers for their wealth, they know it's a low paid, a uh, often violent and unsafe environment, certainly insecure work, but they don't accept their responsibility to take the due diligence, to make things transparent, to find the solutions, then we have a long way to go. But on the question of women, Manoush is right. If you look at the evidence, women are in universities in equal or greater numbers. But something happens when they leave the education system and they go into corporate life or even public sector life. Then the prevailing, uh, well, call it what you like, misogyny, dominance of uh, male power, it actually still creates an environment where there is not a shared acceptance for all of our societal roles from care 
to work. So I have been hearing for a long time, if we just get more women in senior positions, more women on boards, more role models, well, all of that's good. And of course, I would support that. But when it comes to the crunch, that's not happening. And that's not enough. We have to change the way we talk and negotiate our lives with a degree of equality that's not about competition, but is about sharing a, a future of work that's based on, first of all, cohesive societies and equality. And just to, maybe just to pick up on some of those comments, Sharon, let's, let's give you the last word, Manoush. Well, I mean, I, 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 I do think that it, progress hasn't been fast enough. I, I always notice that when you ask women what they think about setting targets for getting more women into, you know, into higher positions, their response usually depends on their age. So younger women say, oh, I want to get ahead on merit and, and not be ben a beneficiary of target. Older women, and I'll put myself in that category, have, and I think as Sharon had implied, you've kind of heard this for a long time and progress has been slow. And so I do think we have to think much harder about being harder edged about requiring faster progress. Um, we're going to leave it there. Um, ladies, thank you very much indeed. Manoush Shafiq, uh, London School of Economics Director, and Sharon Burrow, looking forward to your co-chairing uh, 2018 uh, WEF and uh, seeing what you do to Davos Man this time round. I'm looking forward to uh, some of those debates as well. General Secretary of the International <laughs> Trade Union Confederation. Uh, you can follow us on social media, search CNBC International across all major platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and Instagram. And stay tuned to CNBC to catch our Davos Guide special programming broadcasting throughout the holiday season. And of course, join us in January when Jeff and I will head to the Alps at the World Economic Forum 2018 uh, for five days of live coverage from that event starting on Monday 22nd of January. Thank you very much indeed for watching this edition of the Davos Guide. We'll see you in the Alps.